Welcome to Speaking of Jesus. Each week we hear real people having a real conversation about Jesus, and what He means to them. We want to invigorate you to invite Jesus into your everyday conversations too. So, what do you want to say? This is Jessica Bordolo. I'm here with Dr. Michael Ziegler. Thank you for joining us. It really means a lot to us. This week, we're going to be talking about satire. Satire is the use of humor, irony, or sarcasm to draw attention to foolish or wicked behavior. Making light of a situation, making a criticism in an indirect way, another way to think about it. And you see this in political caricatures. You see it in sitcoms. Stand-up comedians are masters at this. Uh, Shows like uh, Saturday Night Live, opening monologues from talk show hosts, they're all specializing in satire. It's also a writing style. You think back to some classic literature, or even right now, like online news satire, like The Onion, with very descriptive terms, point the finger at something in a funny way. And people have been doing this for a long time. I think one of our guests mentions a very old use of satire, and and it goes way back. So that's how we started the conversation this week. We asked our guests to share one of their favorite examples of satire. My name is Rachel, and the satire I'm talking about is sassy or irreverent voiceovers. Hi, my name is Eric, and uh, the satire I will talk about is actually from Gulliver's Travels. Hey, this is Jessica. I'm going to talk about Hank Hill. And this is Mike. I'm going to talk about a poem by Garrison Keillor. Rachel, tell us about the sassy voiceovers. There are these clips where somebody has taken these old videos or old movies of Jesus like walking through the wilderness with his disciples, <laughs> but then they like dub in these really silly voices over it and like give them like, it's, they're not talking about anything that makes any kind of sense. They're just really making fun in light of a situation. I just think it's funny the stories that they create, you know, around it and it just makes me laugh. All right, Eric, tell us about Gulliver's Travels. Pretty uh, well-known book by Jonathan Swift uh, about a, a guy who uh, shipwrecks on a variety of uh, islands and countries with strange lands. And probably the most famous one they've made cartoons out of it is when he lands on the Lilliputian Island. I think he wakes up all tied down. The whole book is a satire on all sorts of things. But one specifically about Christianity is the Lilliputians have a religious principle on which end they break the eggs, uh, on, on the little end or, or the big end of, of the egg. And like of which side of an hard-boiled egg that you open first? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a satire of Christians who are taking kind of small issues about doctrine and making such a big issue of it. Uh, not that doctrine isn't important, but like small, meaningless issues, perhaps. And they end up killing each other over it. Uh, and of course, he's writing at a time when that is happening more often than not. Jessica, you said Hank Hill? He's a character from a sitcom, a kind of a commentary, a social commentary sitcom that's animated from like 2000 to 2010 is when it ran. And he's the dad in the family. And the family is very... Middle class, kind of Midwestern. I think they live in Texas, but, you know, just like normal salt of the earth kind of people. And they're a church going family. The episode that I'm thinking of specifically, it's daylight savings. So they're late for church and they can't be late for church. So like they're praying that God would turn all the stop stoplights stop green on the way there so they don't have to walk in late. And they get there and like, oh, someone is sitting where they always sit, you know, and they're very respectful, nice people. So in the kindest way, Hank comes up, he's like, excuse me, you look new. Maybe you're just visiting. So you don't know. This is our pew. Yeah, this this is where we sit. So there's some other pews. Why don't you just kind of scoot over to those? Because this is our spot. So they make an appointment with the pastor. And they say to the pastor, you know, this problem happened. Someone was sitting in our pew. But we have a really proactive, positive way to fix this. We will make a seating chart for Sunday mornings. And everyone will have assigned spots and they'll know where to go. Most of us aren't militantly beating people over the head with Bibles. You know, as Christians, that's not how we see ourselves we see ourselves as polite, nice people, like like the hills, right? Making it very obvious to people if they don't belong or that we take possession of our church and this is ours. My example is a poem by Garrison Keillor called I'm a Lutheran. And his first line, he says, or one of the early parts of the poem, he says, We Lutherans are modest people. We never make a fuss. 
and it sure would be a better world if they were all as modest as us. If you come to our church, don't expect to be hugged. Don't expect your hand to be shook. If we need to know who you are, we can look in the visitor's book. I was raised to keep a lid on it. Guard what you say or do. A mighty fortress is our God, so he must be Lutheran too. We could define satire as communication that focuses attention on abuses or distortions within a people group, and and we're picking on Christians now. These abuses or distortions have become easy for insiders to overlook because of our habits, our customs, but satire helps bring that out, and sometimes in a playful way, sometimes in a more of a biting way. When do you find satire becoming offensive? I don't know if you've heard the famous speech by David Foster Wallace, This is Water, and he, uh, he begins with this little story, two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, Morning, boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, What the heck is water? That's kind of what satire is doing. It's sort of showing us what is all around us and that we, we kind of don't see because we're insiders, as you said. It opens our eyes to something that we had been not conscious of. And often this is this thing that we've overlooked could be, could be hurtful to ourselves as a community or, or hurtful to outsiders. And so it's good for it to be uh, brought to our attention. It exposes, it opens our eyes. And, and to do so, it, it might offend a little bit at first, but hopefully we get over that offense you know, laugh at ourselves a little bit. I think the thing with satire is, is that like, it's like, you can say the poem about Lutherans and I grew up Lutheran. I'm a Lutheran. Like I see myself represented in that, but it is, it's a character, right? Like if you've ever had a character drawn, um, I, I, my parents still have it in, um, my, my childhood bedroom, a character of me and my brother when we were kids. And I was so mad when we got this thing drawn. Cause in my mind, it was going to be this like cute, bright picture of us. And like, I have like a, like a little tooth gap between my two front teeth. And like, it's so pronounced in this character. And I was like devastated as you know, 10 year old girl that like, there's this thing that, but I like, I know I've got a tooth gap, but like, it's not, I know that that's not what it is. Now I can rationalize that and I can see the character for being a character. But like, when you look at satire, I can see myself represented in it, but I also understand that it's, it's a caricature. Like for, gosh, I sound so silly saying, well, you know, I'm not that bad, but you know, I think about like, there's a, a video of Mr. Bean going to church and like, they're singing this hymn and it goes on for forever. And just when he finally catches on to like the refrain, and starts to sing it, everybody stops. I've seen and, like, that episode. I can totally like be like, oh yeah, like that's yeah, totally how it can be sometimes. <laughs> but it's it's a caricature. It's not exactly the thing. And so that's why it can be funny because I can see myself represented in it, but I know that that's not the whole of my identity, right? And so like, so satire can be funny um, without being totally like indicting. <laughs> this relationship between taking offense and satire. So if you react to this statement, if you're offended easily, then you're taking yourself too seriously. What's your reaction to that? Do you mostly agree, mostly disagree? I think I agree with that statement, especially with the easily uh, adverb there. To be offended easily is probably because I, I am a bit fragile in my own identity, my own person, especially when it comes to things that are on point and touching a certain criticism about what I do or how I am or how I act. That, of course, if you really are trying to carefully preserve your own identity, in that case, I would say someone is really taking their, their projected image way too seriously, that it's too important to them. I also am a believer that I don't get to tell people when they can be offended or not offended. Like if I do something and somebody tells me they're hurt by it and I say, well, you're, ta you're taking yourself too seriously. I think if somebody tells me they're hurt, I need to stop and listen and be like, okay, that was offensive to you. Like, let's work through what that is, you know? And so like, and maybe that's that repentive spirit that we bring to it that, you know, I don't think it's a black and white issue. Maybe like there's a, a spectrum of what people find offensive and not offensive. And so it's important to listen when people are telling me that something is offensive. That's really helpful, Rachel. Yeah, that's a really good. On the one hand, the New Testament tells us not to intentionally of offend people, you know, put stumbling blocks, even though that the gospel kind of by nature is offensive, you know, on, on one level, we can get that confused and think if we're being faithful Christians, then offending people just goes with the baggage. 
I, I think we should go through every every effort to not offend people. And if our message offends people, that's that's on God, not on us. But we, but we really ought to uh, be winsome and careful and loving. Yeah, that's good. Take offense, and I think that's what the quote is getting at is. Uh, when I take offense easily, then that means I'm assuming something is directed at me personally, that it's somehow uh, threatening my identity, that maybe what the person's saying is a, is a fault of mine that's true and I'm afraid to deal with that, or, or it's undermined my sense of who I am and where I belong in the world. And so there's that kind of uh, maybe more personal taking offense. You know, you're taking it personally. I think we are in a culture right now, though, that has kind of overplayed the offense, being offended hand. There's a lot of what I call sort of pearl clutching uh, at every and, and, and any thing that someone says. It goes along with what people are been calling cancel culture and all of that. It's almost fake. You know, you just you kind of have to be offended at this and that. Now, this, there's a lot of real issues that people need to address today that are serious and and people are offended about. Uh, another phrase that goes around is called virtue signaling, and it goes hand in hand with this. You know, the uh, the idea that being offended at every little thing that's kind of PC, you now uh, uh, signal that by being offended that you're taking a high road on this cause or whatever those, those things might be. And um, again, that goes with the image problem. We're all trying to project some kind of image. And uh, true satire and the the kind of beneficial offense that is given is when we're sort of broken down on the things that we shouldn't be holding on to in the first place. Maybe that's a really good point, too, that it's, it's so nuanced that it's hard. Like, there are some issues that are really important when somebody says, I'm offended by this thing that's happening. Like, we ought to lean in. There's other parts where people are like, I'm offended by this. I'm offended by that. I'm offended by this. And we're offended for the sake of being offended. You know, that's a completely different type of experience, right, that we're dealing with with people. And so, and, and in myself, like, am I getting offended by, like, things that really don't matter, then maybe I need to take a look at like where I'm placing my identity and like spending my energy. <laughs> well, Rachel, I think your distinction about I can say this to myself, if I'm offended easily, then maybe I'm taking myself too seriously. That's a better posture rather than telling other people that they shouldn't be offended. So we've been talking about modern day uses of satire, but it's been an effective tool for centuries. Like Eric mentioned, Gulliver's Travels, this is, it's been around a long time. It's in the Bible. You hear and see and read uses of irony, uh, exaggeration, hyperbole. These are all the tools of satire. And Jesus himself used this to point out sin, but to do it, again, from a, an indirect kind of way, kind of a humorous way. But also a descriptive way, though. It's not like passive-aggressive. It's very descriptive, just a description kind of aimed in a different direction so that you can swallow it. He'll describe things in very vivid terms. It'll snap when the listener will get what he's saying. So he does this with the... The leaders of the the people, Pharisees, uh, synagogue leaders, uh, oftentimes they Jesus knew that they were behaving in a hypocritical sort of way. So he would talk about whitewashed tombs with uh, you know fresh coat of paint, but inside they're full of bones and rotting flesh. And he'd say, you know, you guys are kind of like that. But the goal, though, is that people see a problem. To realize the truth and change it. It's not just to be mean. It's not just to poke at someone. But it's to say, hey, here, look at this part of yourself. It made the Pharisees hopping mad. As you said, he's not doing this to be mean. He's doing this to to show them what they're really like so that they would uh, turn and repent and become one of his disciples. And then as you become a disciple of Jesus, it, it continues. He, he wants to teach and show us where we lack and, and how we can be more and more conformed into the image of God that he's created us to be. Because it's not just poking at outside people, but he, you know, poking at inside people too. Classic example of this is when he says, you know, you, you go to your brother and you point out his little fault. You know, it's like a little speck in his eye, but but if you come to him and you've got a log, you know, you think of like a, a two by four or a, a big timber that you would use in this building a house. That's that's the word, you know, you get this giant timber sticking out of your eye and then you nitpick the faults of, of your brother. That's kind of a ridiculous thing, right? So this week, it's our final episode discussing Jonah. 
and many people have called the whole book an example of satire. Jonah wrote about his experiences, pointed out his own faults in ways that made him look ridiculous, you know, but he knew that he had made a fool of himself and he lets you know that too so that you wouldn't make the same mistakes. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, because their evil has come up before me. But Jonah arose and fled to Tarshish, instead away from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship bound for Tarshish, and after paying its price, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break apart. All the sailors were afraid, and each of them cried out to their own God, and they threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone down into the depths of the ship, and there he fell into a deep sleep. The captain of the ship came and said to him, How can you sleep? Get up! Call on your God! Who knows, maybe your God will give us a thought and we won't perish. Then the sailors said to one another, Come on, let's cast lots and find out who's responsible for this evil that's come against us. And they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they said to him, Tell us, please, Who's responsible for this evil that's come against us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What's your country? From what people are you? And Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. At this, the sailors were afraid with a great fear because they knew that he was running from the Lord, for he had already told them so. So they said to him, tell us what we should do to you to make the sea calm down for us, because the sea was getting even more and more tempestuous. And Jonah said, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm for you, because I know that it is on my account that this storm has come against you. Instead, the sailors did their best to row the ship back to land, but they could not. Because the sea grew even wilder than before. And so the sailors called to the Lord. Oh Lord, do not let us perish because of this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for innocent blood. Because you are the Lord and you you, you do just as you please. And they lifted Jonah up. And they hurled him into the sea. And the raging sea grew calm. And the sailors worshipped the Lord with a great worship, and they offered sacrifice to him, and they vowed vows to him. And then the Lord provided a great fish, and it swallowed Jonah up. And Jonah was inside the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And from inside the belly of the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God, saying, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the sea, into the heart of the deep, an ocean current surrounded me, all your breakers and waves swept over me. I said, I have been cut off from your sight. But I will look again towards your holy temple. The waters around me came up to my neck. The deep engulfed me. The seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, you brought my life up from the pit. O Lord, my God, when my life was ebbing away, O Lord, I remembered you. My prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. From among those who cling to worthless idols, who abandon the one who loves them. But I, 
with a song of thanksgiving, will, will offer sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah out onto dry land. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out to it the message that I am about to speak to you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was a great city belonging to God, a walk of three days. And on the first day, Jonah entered in and called out, Yet in 40 days, Nineveh is about to be overturned. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They trusted God. And they declared a fast. And they put on sackcloth, all of them, from the greatest to the least. And when the message came to the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, and covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. And he issued a proclamation in Nineveh, saying, By the decree of the king and his nobles, people and animals, herds and flocks, no one is to taste anything, neither be given anything to eat nor any water to drink, but let man and beast both be covered in sackcloth, and let everyone urgently call on God, and let them turn, each of them, from their evil ways and from the violence of their hands. Who knows? God may turn and change his verdict and turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, and he changed his verdict about the evil that he had threatened to do to them, and he did not do it. But this was evil to Jonah, a great evil, and he burned with anger. And he said to the Lord, Ah, Lord, isn't this what I said when I was back in my own land? This is the reason that I fled to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and changing your verdict about evil. Now, O Lord, take my life from me because it would be good for me to die and not to live. And the Lord said to Jonah, is it good for you to be angry? But Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he built himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a vine to grow up over Jonah, to give shade to his head, and to deliver him from his evil. And Jonah rejoiced over the vine with a great joy. At dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which struck the vine, and it withered. And after the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun struck Jonah's head, and he became faint, and he asked his soul to die. He said, it would be good for me to die and not to live. And God said to him, is it good for you to be angry about the vine? And Jonah said, it is good. And I am angry enough to die. And the Lord said to him, you yourself had pity for this vine. Though you did not tend it, and you did not make it grow, it sprang up overnight, and overnight it perished. Should I not have pity on Nineveh, this great city in which there are more than 120,000 human beings who don't know the difference between their right and their left? 
and many animals as well. Should I not have compassion on them? What was a word or a phrase that got you this time hearing it? Is it good for you to be angry? And God raised up a vine. I guess the one that I will pick is the Lord said to Jonah, arise. Uh, For me, going through it again was to save him from his evil. Yes, that was another one that I want you to explain. I'm glad you picked that one. Rachel, is it good for you to be angry? I guess I've always identified with Jonah. I I feel like Jonah's pitching a fit. (laughs) He just wants to pitch a fit. And I'm like, it, and it doesn't matter. He's still doing it after he gets bombed up onto a seashore. He's still pitching a fit. That's me sometimes. And, uh, and, and like God, he asks him the question, like, is it good for you to be angry? Right. And like, sometimes like that question, like helps you reflect on like, what's going on here? You know, we, we get our, our brains or our emotions, they get all kind of out of whack. Sometimes we got to bring them all back together. And I think God's just, I mean, it feels weird to say after he's been in the the storm on the seas and been in the belly of a fish and all these things, but God is like gently like bringing Jonah along, like, come on, is it good for you to be angry? And I, I just, I think that God probably asked me that question. Like if God is like watching my day to day actions, I think he would um, say, Rachel, is it good for you? to want to pitch a fit about this. And I love it that Jonah doesn't answer the first time. He just gets up and leaves. <laughs> like slams the door when he goes to his room, right? Like, and, then, and then he just kind of, God's like, okay, I'll give you your space for a little bit. And then Eric's line, uh, he, he raised up a vine. To me, the vine and the fish are the two biggest points of satire in the entire book. In other words, it's the it does two things. One is it's the strangest part of the book, right? Both of those things. Now I'm going to put on my historian geek hat on. It's also the, the it's also the two things that people have gotten the most bent out of shape about. Whether a fish could swallow Jonah or not has been a huge fit in modern history, right? Could this possibly have happened? Uh, in early church history, it was actually all about the vine. But I just think it's funny that these two these two texts and these two moments in the story, which are the high point of of both satire, a fish that picks up jo- Jonah and, and, and swallows him in a place where he should be destroyed, he's saved, and, and a plant that grows up immediately overnight and then uh, dies the next day, you know, it sort of stretches credulity. It's precisely the places where God offers grace to a guy who doesn't deserve it. Like he, there's nothing Jonah does right before this, that would merit the kind of thing. Jonah should be thrown overboard. He's the worst prophet in the world. And God rescues him through a fish. And then he has this terrible attitude. You know, he has, he he preaches the worst sermon. I mean, he just does the bare minimum of what God asked him to do. You know, the Ninevites appreciated brevity, but uh, nonetheless, uh, he just does the bare minimum. And then he complains about it, just as Rachel was pointing out, you know, this terrible approach uh, to this. This is my problem with you, God, is that you're gracious and you and you change your mind from disaster. And so what does God do after he gets a non-answer from his question of whether he should be angry? He gives him a plant to save him from the heat of the sun. Both of those instances, it illustrates God's kind of reckless grace and Jonah's inability to grasp it. You know, he gets angry about that plant more than he cares about people. I mean, it just, it just lays out the final linchpin of the whole argument is sort of hangs on this, the illustration of the plant. It just struck me as you read the whole thing, how it all built up to that and how absurd it is and actually how absurd we are as, as people who get completely offended and angry about things that we can't control. And we, we step over our brothers and sisters to make that point rather than, rather than caring and loving for them. Jessica, you said it was a, a rise. When God showed Jonah how upset he got over not being comfortable compared to how much he didn't care about these people dying, that that would save him from the evil of his selfish thinking. And that would save him from the, the, the evil of his complacency and, and like self-righteousness, that God was providing that plant to help him see that. What a nice way to help somebody see that. You could do it in a lot of mean ways, but 
giving somebody a shady tree that's that's gentle. I think what we lose in a lot of English translations is when we play around with that word because we're afraid to ascribe evil of God. And then so we translate it as disaster and a variety of other things. And then that gets lost in chapter four when it, sometimes English translations will say to save him from his discomfort or something like that, or to save him from his heat stroke. But it's the same word. We've talked about this, I think, last time too, though. It's still important, though, for us to remember and point out that God is not evil and that he doesn't incur, doesn't send temptation and evil to us to watch us suffer, or that he is good, that all good gifts come from him. So this is good. Don't you think it's good to say that too? Because you'd hate for people to think that God is evil because he's not. We can trust him. I think we risk missing the point of the story. The whole story is leading Jonah because what is the what does Jonah call God? He calls God evil. He said, you're evil. He basically tells God he's evil because you forgive and you're merciful and you're gracious and compassionate. And so this is a great evil, God. And so that's the it's that's the joke, so to speak, is that it's trying to help us see that we don't get to decide good and evil. That was the temptation from the beginning, remember? Recognizing that evil, the word here is, is like you said, is an ambiguous word that, or is a broad word that encompasses things like disaster and wrath and punishment. And I think we certainly do say that God sends punishment. He is angry. He is wrathful at sin. And when he turns away from his wrath towards sin, that's a gracious event. But the fact that he's wrathful towards sin is not, doesn't mean that God's evil, him morally evil. It actually expresses his goodness. If God's not angry about this, he's not a loving God. In fact, I don't really want a God who wouldn't be deeply disturbed and angry about this kind of violence that happens. We want to also be careful not to pit God's goodness against righteous anger or punishment, and and he does wound in order to heal, finally help him see discontinuity and incongruity between his way of thinking about God and about people and the way God thinks about them. Like when I punish my kids, right? Like they would consider me quite evil when I say they don't get a cookie because I didn't eat broccoli. But I'm doing that because I love them and I'm, I'm sending them this disaster because I care about them. And so I'm not being evil, even though it seems to them that I may be. Yeah, that's, that's good. I think that preserves both, doesn't it? That God is good and that he can be righteously ang- angry. And by using that same word, evil, it's almost like, God saying, Jonah, you think I'm you think I'm evil, but I'm not. I'll show you. I'll let you see how you are the evil one. Helping us see that when we put ourselves up as the judge and we want to know good and evil, like the serpent said to Eve and Adam in the garden, you know, you you will be wise and you will be able to just to know good good and evil. This has been the, our whole struggle as human beings since then is that we want to play the judge. And we want to say when to burn the city <laughs> and when to, you know, have mercy on me. And, and God's saying, no, you don't get to do that. In fact, that's what's making you evil right now. And that's, that's what's so baffling about it is that he, he asks him questions. Is it good for you to be angry? He, he doesn't come, even Jonah's being so ridiculous and absurd, God humbles himself to talk with Jonah like a friend and, and thereby elevating him, even though he should not be elevated right now. He, he has, doesn't, hasn't done anything to merit friendship with God. God's nonetheless treating him like a friend. Yeah. God's character here is so patient. Like you said, he's, he's speaking to him as a friend. Jonah exhibits the exact opposite, of course. He's impatient with everyone. He goes through the motions quickly and finally bursts out in anger. And God is sort of just, again, undeservedly patient with this worst of all prophets, evidently, um, walking him through the problem, giving him parables of illustration, you know, uh, uh, visual images to help him sort of see, look, here's this plant, you know, and um, asking him patient questions all the way through. So the, the contrast between the spokesman of God and, and the people of God and 
and God himself couldn't be stronger. And it helps us then, I think, as people who want to be like uh, children of our Heavenly Father to start start acting a little bit more like him, uh, seeing what his character is like. How are you hearing good news in this for you? The reality that Jonah had had a change of heart at some point after the events in the narration end, this is all between God and Jonah. Nobody, nobody would have had, had to know, but that he would, he would write, that God's spirit would move him to write a book about this, write a story in which the, he's a fool, but God's the hero. That, that's good news for me, that, that to see the work of God in Jonah in, in that way that he can satirize himself. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, like, there's good news for me personally in that, like, in my flaws and imperfections that I can see myself represented in the story of Jonah. And I know that if God is working in and through uh, a prophet like Jonah, (laughs) that, like, he can work in and through me to be um, sharing his love, sharing God's love um, with the people in my family and my friends and in my community, that um, even on those days where I feel unloving and imperfect, that God can and will and does work um, in and through me in those times. But also, I just can't get past, like, the picture of God's pursuit of his people that we get in Jonah, that God is constantly pursuing Jonah, (laughs) even when we're like, he's like running the opposite direction that God pursues him in that. But like, we, we get kind of stuck in that story of, you know, I'm obviously, this is like the main storyline that's going through, but like, also God is like, he's saving his, the people in Nineveh from destruction as well, you know, and like that there's this, this constant story of God pursuing his people that God, that God saves, that God's work is, is a saving work that he is, that he's trying to work out and he's doing in and amongst us. And so I love when I get to see the picture of God pursuing, um, because I know that he's pursuing me and he's pursuing, pursuing all of us, you know, kind of ties into what I, what I see in it. I mean, the, the story of Jonah in the old Testament is the old Testament version, Jesus's story of the prodigal son, almost identically in, in many ways in terms of who you identify with. So the people of Nineveh are, is the, they are the prodigal son. And the older brother is Jonah. The dynamic is the same. And the father is God. And at the end of the story, the father comes out to the indignant and angry brother uh, who does not like the fact that uh, at, at the moment of repentance, this vile person that is his younger brother uh, is celebrated and brought back in. And he patiently comes out uh, and pursues both, right? When you hear the story of the prodigal son, you realize... Uh, we are meant to identify with more than one figure in this story. At times we are the prodigal and at other times we are the indignant older brother. Uh, this, the story of Jonah is the Old Testament, precisely the Old Testament version of this very same thing. And I've always seen the prodigal son as really the, the central, apart from the story of, of the crucifixion and resurrection itself, which is, its, which is the, the thing that happens itself, is the epitome of, of what, the, what Jesus has come to tell us about, about God's love for us. And Jonah does that for me in spades. Jonah, in some ways, plays both parts because he, unlike the older brother in Jesus' parable, he can't say, I've always been faithful to you. I've never disobeyed your commands. <laughs> Jonah can't even say that. No. <laughs> yeah, the prodigal son in the New Testament is down wallowing with the pigs and, and, and Jonah is at the belly of a whale. I mean, they're both in the worst possible places too. Yeah. And like you said, God loves them both. And is, and is like Rachel said, is pursuing us with equal care and concern. What do you want to say to people, Rachel? I'm thinking about the people who we would equate to those who are Ninevites today, those people who are outside. This idea that there are people who are like, are beyond saving, who are outside of, of the reach of God, who whose lifestyles are such a way or whatever. I'm thinking about people who I know who feel like they've received that message from people. And what I know is that Somebody is embarrassed that God did the work to save me. Somebody looks at me and says, she's not worth saving. That like, God, why would you, why, why would you send me to do the work to save, save that person? Right. But like that God did it anyway, that God does it anyway. And that in the same way that God does it for me, we're in this together. God's do, God's done. He's doing the same thing for you. God sent Jesus to do this for you, that God's, work of redemption is something that we can't always like fully comprehend why God would save things that seem unlovely, um, but that he loves us still and pursues us still. And so I think that there are a lot of people in this world who are hurting 
because we've we've been embarrassed by the work that God is doing. And I would want to give them those words of love that like, I can see myself in the story too. Like we're, we're all, we, we can all see ourselves in the story if I can, if I sit back and look at it and take a, take a deeper look. I loved Eric's example with the, the hard boiled egg from uh, Gulliver's Travels. Right, where there was a war that erupted over which side you should open up your hard-boiled egg on, the small side or the big side. So just just eat the egg. That Don't quibble about these points of doctrine. You have this amazing God who loves you. Relate to him. Listen to his word. Pray to him. Talk to him. Tell others about him. That's Eat the egg. That's the point. We talked through the entire book of Jonah. This is the second time where I've, we've done one I've never studied before or given a lot of thought to, but I ended up just loving it. He is so different. So the, the other minor prophets, that's the collection of books from the Old Testament in Jewish circles. It's just called the Book of the Twelve. Individual books are named for the prophet who wrote it, who's featured in the book. And there's a similarity among all of them. It's God gives a message to his people. He tells the prophet to speak it, to preach it. Uh, sometimes it's for his own people. Sometimes it's for people in the other countries. The book is the content of the message that God gives for Judah or for Nineveh in, in some cases. Right. In those other books, it's like you're reading a sermon. You know, it's just you're just reading what God has told him to say. But in Jonah, the sermon is just a couple words. The whole rest of the book is showing who God is by his interactions with Jonah. He pursues Jonah. He sends a big fish to save him. And then he gives Jonah a second chance. He gives Nineveh a second chance. He keeps sending Jonah object lessons <laughs> to help him figure it out. All the time while he's working for the salvation of a Gentile nation. They're not his chosen people. Everybody he intends to have as his people. That's his goal. He wants to save everybody. Israel and Judah, they are his instrument, his means to reach the nations. Comes across so clearly in the last line of the book of Jonah that, you know, you had pity on this plant. Shouldn't I have pity on Nineveh? This great city, there's more than 120,000 people there, and, and they don't even know their right hand from their left in, in a way to say they're morally, they're just lost. Uh, and they've got a lot of cattle, you know, that he's even concerned about not only how many people live there, he knows the, he know, knows the number of hairs on their head, and he's concerned about their animals too. He loves his whole creation. What was the other book? You said you, there was a couple. Well, it was the book of Jonah and the book of Daniel. I liked it so much that I led a Bible study on it with my small group. I used your sermons from the Lutheran Hour and the corresponding episodes of this show, of Speaking of Jesus, as the basis for the, the study. I would have the group listen to your uh, Lutheran Hour sermon sometime during the week, you know, whenever. Listen to the conversation and think about it, kind of like let it roll around in their mind. And then we'd meet online or in person, but it's been online for, for a long time. And we would discuss... I would even use the same questions that you used on this show. But if you can just listen to the sermon and listen to the podcast while you're doing other stuff during the week and then gather together for an hour and talk about it, it just seems more accessible of a Bible study. I, I've loved it. I've been real thankful. Thank you for, for sharing that. That's that's our hope. That's our, our passion. We, we want to put these materials out there that people can use them. Find us on our website. We've got written resources there, uh, links to the messages for the Lutheran Hour, it's all there. So Jesuspodcast.org. Everything is kind of categorized by episode, including the written things you can download. Shoot me a message about how it went. Um, I'd love to hear, and I promise to write back. We're going to be making some changes to the Speaking of Jesus podcast. We've almost got 100 episodes under our belt, and we're going to be taking a pause, a pause in the weekly production schedule beginning in June. But we plan to be back with a revised and enhanced podcast. During this production pause, we're still going to be sending out new content, updated content. It's just going to be a little less frequent, but with a nice bit of variety. We've got a lot of interesting things planned, and we want your continued involvement. To do so, please be part of our Speaking of Jesus Facebook group, or if you're not on Facebook, join our email list, or you can do both. Either options or both options will keep you up to date and receiving our latest offerings. Taking a pause in the weekly production is going to be an opportunity to plan for the future, to build upon the current podcast and expand our conversation, always with the goal of getting more and more people speaking of Jesus. So what do you want to say? 
be sure to join our Facebook group. Register for our email list found on the Speaking of Jesus webpage. That's jesuspodcast.org. Thanks for being a part of the conversation. Next week, we'll begin our last series, a four-part discussion on David Coe's latest book, Provoking Proverbs. And that's going to be our guide for the book of Proverbs. And we'll have the author with us on the show as part of the discussion. We'll be discussing the wisdom sayings of Solomon the Great. We pray that this week's podcast has encouraged you in your faith and has invigorated you to speak of his love into the lives of those around you. See you next week. As always, we'll hear from Dr. Ziegler in a real conversation between real people speaking of Jesus. What do you want to say? Yeah, so we'll riff on the egg a little bit and then you can transition. Okay. So there it is. Eat the egg. Mm-hmm.